Ninety years ago, our longest serving monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, was born. Since then, millions of us have met her, and many have got close. You're having a good old stare at the Queen, aren't you? Oh, yes, we are. I had a good view of her. But how well do we know her? She uh, is on our stamps, and she's on our coins, and she's in our hearts. And how well does she know us? She gave me a puppy. All right. Which was very nice. This is Her Majesty, as you've never seen her before. Good Queen hair you've got going on there. I was completely paralysed as this amazing icon walked over my gangway. A people's portrait of the Queen. She wasn't there doing a job. She was there because she was genuinely concerned. This is your main workshop now, then, is it here? In this series, it's handbags at dawn for John Craven. All right. And what's... what's it's obviously leather. Ah. Oh, can I not touch it? Oh, look at them! Carol Kirkwood meets a pint-sized pony who munched on Her Majesty. No, bless him. Did the Queen think it was funny? She thought it was hilarious. She knows Shetlands, so she knows they've got a mind of their own. That's for me. Well, I'm going to be talking to people with amazing tales of meeting Her Majesty the Queen in a place that's very dear to my heart. So, where am I? Well, it's a beautiful part of the world. Stunning views, spectacular castles, and, uh, dare I say it, <laughs> Fabulous singers. It is, of course, my homeland, Wales. And uh, what do you think about this? Good way to travel? I'd say so. And it's how the Queen arrived here in Carnarvon 45 years ago for a very special occasion. But more on that later. This is a genuine Landau carriage. Basically, for you and me, it means a convertible. Wherever she goes, crowds, of course, gather, and it's important for her to be seen by the crowds. So, uh, let me tell you now, there's no way of being incognito when you're in this thing. Everyone stares at you. Hi. Hi. It's not quite the turnout the Queen gets, but, you know, I could get used to this. <laughs> that lady's just said there's a Queen in the carriage. I don't know what she means. The Welsh people got their very first glimpse of the newly appointed Queen in 1952 when she opened a dam in Clydewen, South Wales. Now then, I've been uh, very fortunate to sing for the Queen on many occasions, but I'm hoping that by talking to other Welsh people who've met her, I'll get a more rounded idea of what she's actually like as a person. I'm also dying to find out why she's got this special relationship with my country. I think the Queen's doing amazing to be still doing what she's done at 90. Yeah, she looks really good for her age. Well, I certainly think she saved the monarchy. I think she looks fantastic. She's always decked out really well. She looks really polished and it's something to look up to and, you know, inspire people. I think she's done marvellous, really. Happy 90th birthday, Your Majesty. Very, very happy birthday, Your Majesty. I think you're absolutely wonderful. She's <laughs> kept herself fit. Keep going as long as you can. We've still got a few more years to go. As Britain's longest serving monarch, the Queen has clocked up countless visits to Wales. Among the hills and valleys of Wales, the royal travellers were to find many welcomes. Over the years, she's joined us for our famous Eisteddfod festivals. We've sung to her, obviously. We've even shouted for her. From Barry to Bangor, whether by royal train, plane or yacht, Her Majesty has always enjoyed a very warm Croesoi Gymru. And now, a great moment for a small girl. Four and a half year old Margaret Ellis presented a bouquet. But the Queen's not just there for the good times. She also supports our nation during its darkest moments. Well, mountains all over Wales, but uh, these are the mountains of South Wales, so we're down the valleys. Uh, it's a really great part of the world, absolutely amazing. Lots of choirs, lots of really close-knit communities as well. People really look out for one another.
nowhere more so than one village here in the Taff Valley. 50 years ago, its name became known to the world. It would gain a very special place in the Queen's heart. She returned here again and again. A whole generation has been wiped out. Disaster struck here in Abervan on the 21st of October, 1966, when a huge pile of coal waste slid down from the hills, engulfing the junior school. Parents and teachers joined police, firemen, civil defence workers and mine rescue teams at the school. Some of the helpers tore at the rubble with bare hands in their desperate efforts to get at the children. And this is where Pank Glass Junior School was. Here one minute, gone the next, as half a million tons of slurry demolished it. It was a terrible, terrible tragedy. 116 children, aged seven and eight, lost their lives, bless their hearts. Jeff Edwards remembers it vividly. He was just eight years old when he arrived for school on that dreadful day. Where was your classroom? Then? This is one of my classroom here. Right. And we went in into the uh, classroom. The teacher then was starting a mathematics lesson, and there was this roaring sound, and uh, the light started to shake. And uh, the teacher said to us, uh, reassuring us really, "Oh, don't worry, it's only thunder." And that noise got noisier and noisier. And then next thing I remember was waking up with all this tip material all over me. It took just five minutes for the deadly landslide to sweep down from the hills and bury the school. The roof had collapsed on top of me and I was fortunate because that actually saved me. Uh, it provided me with a pocket of air that enabled me to breathe. I tried to get out, there was all these screams and shouts, but those screams and shouts got less and less as time went on uh, because Obviously, people were dying uh, because of the lack of air. In the end, I heard the firemen shout to me, uh, basically saying, oh, there's a boy with white hair down here. They started to get, dig around me. I was the last one to come out alive. It took a week to recover all the bodies. How hard has it been for you to, to cope with the fact that you survived and so many didn't? It's, it's been very difficult. Guilt is the main issue, really. really. You feel guilty that you've survived and others haven't. And that's a huge thing that uh, is difficult to come to terms with. Even now? Even now, yeah. One minute we were all happy kids going to school and we then had no friends. All my friends were destroyed in the disaster. Out of my class, only four of us survived. So it was a huge impact, really, on us. And we had to grow up very, very quickly. You know, 50 years have gone on, but we don't forget. No. Or we can't forget. And what happened to us uh, will be with me until I die. Wow, what an honour to meet Jeff. What a, what a brave man he is. You, you can tell that, you know, 50 years on, the offence of Abervan still haunt him greatly, but my goodness me, who, who can blame him for showing emotion? Uh, I would, I know that. I can't think of anything worse as a parent than losing your kids, you know, and you think they're going to be safe when they go to school, don't you? One week later, the Queen visited the stricken village. Mary, how are you? Lovely to see you. And you as well. Mary Morris, whose daughter survived the disaster by climbing out of one of the school windows, was among the hundreds of villagers who lined the street for the Queen's visit. 
Now, I, I definitely recognise the Queen in this photo, yes, yes. but I think I recognise somebody else. Yes. That's it's you, isn't that's it? That's myself, yes. That's myself. You're having a good old stare at the Queen, aren't oh, you? Oh, yes, we are. I had a good view of her. But she did speak to us, you know, and... Uh, what did she say? Well, she said, you know, uh, I'm sorry, you know, it's a terrible thing that's happened. And how do you all feel? We were numbed, weren't we? You of know, course. I don't think it sunk in, really, mm. what had really happened. Because when I relate it today, people can't believe that, uh, you know, that happened, you see? She seems to care a lot about what happened here. Oh, she does. Life. She's very... Yes, yeah, she, she does, you know. She was just seemed an ordinary... a mother and an ordinary woman. Yeah. You know, we didn't think of her as royalty. Many of the children who died were the same age as the Queen's son, Prince Andrew. Abhavan left her deeply moved as a queen and a mother. She returned to the village four times. And in 1973, she opened a new community centre. This centre looks to the future. It stands as a symbol of the determination that out of the disaster should come a richer and a fuller life. This was also when Jeff Edwards met the Queen for the first time, the first of many meetings. Obviously, I was still a youngster then, uh, 12, 13 years of age, and we were fascinated by the big Rolls Royce that turned Gosh, up were... <laughs> with uh, George and the Dragon on the front, really. On her third visit in 1997, she planted a tree in the memorial garden, which stands to this day. And on that same visit, Jeff met the Queen again, which led to a special gift. She's saying, well, what are you doing now? And uh, I'd come back from London and uh, opened a community project for young people who would have traditionally gone into the mining industry, but with a colliery closing, uh, were basically unemployed. Uh -huh. And consequently turned to alcohol and crime to alleviate their boredom, really. A couple of weeks later, I had a call from Buckingham Palace and uh, he said, Her Majesty would like to make a personal donation to your project. This me. And, uh, How did you feel? Well, we were absolutely over the moon, really. Why do you think she cares so much about this place? I think probably because she's a parent herself, uh, because uh, it was early in her reign that this happened. It was probably one of the most tragic incidents that happened during her reign. Yeah. And obviously, like many people who come from all over the world still to Abhavan these days, is that they want to pay their respects. In 2012, the Queen made perhaps her most poignant return to open a new primary school. Alongside Jeff, head teacher Simone Roden was also there to greet Her Majesty. It was an exciting day, exciting for staff, pupils, governors, parents, the whole community. It was fantastic. She made a promise to the people of Abavan and she said to them, you build your new school and I'll come back and open it. And Clearly, she did that. She was a lady of her word. And as soon as the school was open, in no time at all, she was invited down, she accepted the invitation, and she arrived in all her glory. Capturing some of that queenly glory. Hi, guys, how are you? You all right? Very well, thank nice you. Nice to see you, Mr Burns. Yep. Some budding Michelangelos from Mr Burns' class. Good queen hair you've got going on there. Did any of you meet the Queen when she came? Yeah. Yep, yep. What was she like? She was, um, she's, she's really nice. Really nice? Yeah. Were you scared about meeting her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were you? Were you nervous? I was nervous the first time I met her. My legs were shaking like that. She, she like, came in a big car and she left in a red helicopter. Yeah, that's the way to travel. Yeah. Are you jealous? <laughs> Finish. You're quick. You done as well? Yep. Good work. Yours looks like your teacher. Look a little bit like a teacher. <laughs> if Mr. Burns was King of England, then that, that would be a brilliant, brilliant drawing. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to meet her again in the future? Maybe. Since I was born on her birthday. Oh, were you? Ah, oh, so that was April the 21st. 21st. But you're not 89. No. No. But you know, she's gonna be 90, isn't she? Yeah. And you know, do you know how many things she does every week. How many engagements, like coming to this school? Five every week. 
at the age of 90. That's amazing, isn't it? 90. She should be at home watching EastEnders <laughs> with her feet up, uh, eating chocolates. Yeah. Now, listen, before I leave in my helicopter... I haven't got a helicopter, have I? <laughs> no. Uh, what would you like to say to the Queen? Go on. Happy 90th birthday, Your Majesty. What a happy and vibrant place that is. And how brilliant that something so positive as this school has been born out of something so dark and tragic. I reckon with this building at the heart of this community, Abivan's future is a very, very bright one. We Welsh have plenty of tales of special moments shared with the Queen, as rugby fan Lynn Evans fondly remembers. I actually met the Queen uh, the first time in November 1980. It was the centenary of the Welsh Rugby Union. I grabbed my old Polaroid camera, took it with me and stood against a barrier just outside the City Hall. The, the Queen's car pulled up and I took a photograph of the, her, her arrival. And as she came towards me, I offered her the, the, the photograph I had taken. And she said, would you like to keep it? And I said, uh, no, ma'am, I'd like you to, to have it. And I remember the ma'am. I said, uh, no, I'd like you to have it. Uh, but if you stand still long enough, I will take another one. And she actually stood still for me to take the picture. Unfortunately, the picture was very, very blurred. And the only picture I could get was of her and the Prince Philip leaving the city all in the car, and that was blurred as well. But it left me with a nice memory. Now, talking of memories, I have a cracking tale to tell about the first time I met the Queen. But first, we have to go back 36 years. Tell you what, I, I really love this place. It's Bangor Cathedral. It's where I learnt my craft. I was here as a chorister from the age of 9 to 11. That means uh, services on a Tuesday, uh, on a Thursday, rehearsals on a Friday and Saturday, two services on a Sunday. I was really, really happy here, but I had no idea that the old warbling would lead to uh, royal meetings. Who'd have thought? Wow, this takes me back. Hasn't changed a bit. I remember when I first walked in here as a young kid, I thought this was like the biggest building in the whole world. I'd never seen anything like it. And the smell is still the same. Back then I thought it was, uh, I don't know, history in the walls of the place that was making it smell like this. And I remember being really disappointed when someone said it was the oil radiator heating up the cathedral. It's still there. My goodness me, it takes me back. This was my spot as a chorister for four years in Bangor Cathedral. I was actually probably about this tall, uh, truth be known. But you know what? Without the hours of practice and singing I put in here, I think the first meeting with the Queen I had would have been a complete nightmare. Well, actually, it was a little bit of a nightmare anyway. I'd been asked by Andrew Lloyd Webber to close the first half of a, a royal gala performance in Edinburgh. But my performance in front of Her Majesty didn't quite go according to plan. It was the biggest concert I'd ever done in my life. Mum and Dad were excited as well. On the bill were people like Shirley Bassey, uh, Linda Evans from Dynasty. You know, it was huge, about 200 acts. Alan Jones. My job was to sing that Lloyd Webber classic, Memory. Only I had to sing it from memory, because on the night, I wasn't allowed to use the score. And then in between the first verse and the second verse, it goes ding, 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 ding. On the second ding, 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 I looked down the whole hall and I saw an exit sign in red with the E flickering a little bit. And I thought to myself, I haven't got a clue what's coming next. I've forgotten the words. And I had two and a half seconds to think of something. Thankfully, I came up with some words of my own. I said something like, 
memory, I can hear the choir singing. They are singing alone. I can hear them singing beautiful songs and the memory lingers on. Finally, legs shaking, uh, dry mouth, looking terrified. I went back to the normal words for verse three, four and five. Honestly, I feel sick telling the story now. So as you can imagine, I finished the performance. Uh, everyone was lovely. Well, everyone bar Rory Bremner. He came bounding up to me uh, beside the stage and went, you were singing memory. You don't have one. As you can imagine, that went down really, really well. And my recurring nightmare throughout my childhood, and no word of a lie, sort of bolt upright in the dark of night, would be what would have happened if I hadn't made the words up. And in my nightmare, what I do is I look up at the Queen and Prince Philip, who were just there in the royal box, and I go, I'm really sorry, Your Majesty, and run off stage crying, never to be heard of again, as she's shouting, to the tower with him. You know, at the end of those royal variety type concerts, there's always a lineup where you meet the Queen. She put her arm out and shook my hand. I was so scared, I was so nervous, shaking like mad. And she said, oh, you've got a beautiful voice, well done. I really enjoyed your interpretation and uh, good luck in the future. Phew, thank God. <laughs> you know, after that, if ever I saw her on television until I met her again, I always thought of her as kind of like my gran or something like that, you know, because she just put me instantly at ease. You know, I've sung for her now loads of times and um, she's always charming she's always interested in what you do and you think to yourself how many people must she meet a day it's just phenomenal amazing amazing woman her majesty has a gift for putting us all at ease on big occasions a gift she extends to her own family Here at Carnarvon Castle 45 years ago, the Queen helped her young son, Charles, through a very grand event. The day she formally made him the Prince of Wales. Right then, here's a bit of history for you. Edward II was the first English prince to hold the title, the Prince of Wales. That was way back in 1301. And I got thinking, maybe it is that link with ancient royal history that makes Wales such a special place for the Queen. The Prince of Wales Investiture, the ancient ritual dating back to the 14th century, was conducted with full pomp and ceremony. It was watched by millions on TV and 4,000 lucky people inside the castle. The symbol of sovereignty. Anne Bond had one of the best seats in the house, but she had to sing for it. Lovely to see you. Thanks so much for meeting me. How are you? I'm fine. Freezing cold? I'm freezing cold. So this is the scene of your performing triumph? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. It, it's just absolutely incredible. Uh, I've used some of the memorabilia that I've got to actually place the chair exactly where I was. Oh, so this is, this is where you were? This is actually where I was sitting. So, so tell me, what, what was your involvement in, in the whole thing then? Uh, well, as part of the choir, we'd been rehearsing from the February through to the, to the July. So what we've actually got here is some of the footage of uh, the that. actually choir itself. There I am. With the Back. specs? Back. Oh, that's you. With Just the specs? With the specs. <laughs> no way. You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> oh, I love you. 16-year-old <laughs> Anne Bond was one of 200 choristers lending an enthusiastic Welsh voice to the momentous occasion. Set the scene for me now, then. So you're sitting here. Yes. Where was the Queen to start with? There. On, on the dais there, so the Queen, uh, Duke of Edinburgh, and obviously Prince Charles were there. You were dead close, weren't you? <laughs> it, Touching When distance. we actually came in here and saw just how close we were, we actually couldn't believe it. We thought we'd be tucked away yeah. somewhere. How do you feel when you're looking at that? God. I mean, you, you look across, it just it's doesn't, amazing. It doesn't seem real. It's, yeah. It doesn't get bigger than that, does no. it? No, it, it, it honestly doesn't. The gold ring symbol of unity. Because the family themselves were there, you could see that there were little glances of encouragement and, really? and things. And we were close enough to be able to see oh, that amazing. sort of thing. You just got the feeling all the time that she was 
trying to give him strength and confidence and to reassure him that everything was fine and it was going well. And you could just see these looks, the, the sort of looks that a mum gives a child to right. sort of say, you're, you're doing OK, yeah. So it's, far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> And it was just the way it was mother... It was very much mother and son yeah. in that moment. And it, it was almost everything went completely quiet. Uh, it, it was... It was very moving at the time, actually. It was an emotional moment for the young prince and his mum. Meanwhile, the choir were doing their bit for Queen and Country, too. This is the folder that they gave us with the music. God, all handwritten. It was all handwritten. That's amazing. And... I'm really impressed as well, because, you know, not, you're not like the typical chorister that would doodle and write little messages to their mates and stuff <laughs> on it. Uh, you, you, you've kept it. It's pristine. I suppose <laughs> well, it was quite bad. a big event, wasn't it? Well, so it was you... a bit, yes. Yeah. And then it what, what part were you? Were you soprano? I, uh, no, I sang alto. Alto, OK. Yeah. I mean, back in those days, I could sing anything from soprano down to tenor. OK, you're just showing I, off. No, I, yeah, yeah. I haven't got the range anymore. Oh, no, darling. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we go back 46 years and have a go? Oh, God. You were about here. Go on, then. Yeah, go I was going to say, I'll play Her Majesty, but I'll just hold <laughs> no, no. This, this massive <laughs> score with you before you get blown off. So, go on, then. You start. Among the ancient mountains and from our lovely vales Oh, let the prayer be echoed. God bless the Prince of Wales. Now I know why you got the job. Oh, what a great singer you are. I enjoyed that. That was great. Yeah. It would have been I better if I... I sang with Alan Jones. Well, I was going to say, I can say I sang with you. <laughs> Unfortunately, Her Majesty wasn't oh, here to... Or maybe well, fortunate that well, Her Majesty maybe, wasn't here to yes, listen to Yes, us. absolutely. <laughs> What great memories from Anne. She was clearly moved by seeing Her Majesty being every bit a mum as much as a head of state. And that footage of the young prince having to perform with the eyes of the world on him really takes me back. Thirty years ago, I was a young boy soprano growing up on Anglesey, just ten miles from Carnarvon. And there it is in all, all its glory. My old school, David Hughes Comprehensive. About a thousand pupils or something like that. None of them really knowing what I got up to at weekends. That's the way I liked it. <laughs> but in 1985, my cover was blown by a documentary crew. I keep my schooling and singing very separate, really, because I get teased quite a lot at school. And when you wear a cassock and a frill and you sing in a high voice, it's just something you keep from your other mates. By the time Walking in the Air came about, I was about 14 and a half. So as you can imagine, every 11, 12 and 13-year-old, every break time would go, Sally Jones, Walking in the Air. It's really funny for the first 500 times, but after about 5,000 times, you just want to run out of that school and never go back. If my voice would have broken when I was about 12, 13 years old, when other boys' voices break, um, I'd, none of this would have happened to me. I'd just be a normal, plain, ordinary boy. And, of course, I would never have met the Queen, let alone sung for her. You know, as a family, we would uh, sit down and listen to the Queen's message at Christmas. Uh, but um, other than that, being in this part of the world, you didn't really know much about the royal family, um, except what you maybe saw on television. I remember um, going to Carnarvon as a youngster, because I think uh, Prince Charles was making a visit. And I remember standing on a lamppost uh, and on my friend's shoulders, just so we could see a glimpse of his car as it drove past. Um, but unfortunately, about 10,000 other people had the same idea, so um, all I saw was I think it was an exhaust or something like that. There are some folk who have made it their life's ambition to meet the Queen not just once, but hundreds of times. 
Yes, the Queen has her groupies, superfans who follow her across the country. And here in Ruthin, Denbyshire, I think I've tracked down Wales's number one fan. My goodness me. Oh, welcome <laughs> to my home. Thank you. You, my, like, you uh, like the Queen, don't you? <laughs> my Royal Museum. <laughs> my goodness me. So much stuff here. Amateur photographer Colin Edwards has been an avid Queen spotter since watching her coronation as a small boy on the family's first telly. Over 30 years, he's travelled thousands of miles, tracking royal visits and snapping over 6,000 photos of Her Majesty. A lot of the, the photos I see, all the, the Queen's looking like I don't normally see her. You know, she's very, well, she's a monarch in lots of the photos, yes. whereas you, you've got more of a sort of a, a personal side to it. Well, I think. I think, you know, people like myself, we're called royal watchers and we stand for ages waiting to see her and, and, and we get our photographs and they're a bit more candid and informal. Yeah. We capture her informality. It's more lovely. than the press, uh, official press photographers. Right. She always comes and speaks to us, you know, and she's right. very relaxed. Has she ever said, Colin, not today, I'm having a bad hair day? <laughs> no, she hasn't said that yet, no. She never has a bad hair day, that's she right. She doesn't call me Colin. Right. Uh, it's protocol. Uh, Diana always called me Colin. Yeah. Um, she was very informal, but the Queen never, ever gives people their name. Have you got any photos that I can yes, see? Yes, of course. Oh, there's one. That's a great one. Well... I tell you what, that's got to be the closest photo of the Queen I've ever seen in my life. Look at that. <laughs> it's practically this close. <laughs> that's brilliant. Any more? Yes, of course. I ask him any more. He's got 6,000 to get through. Yeah, Sit just, down, we could be some time. You'd be here all day if yeah, you were in Absolutely. Hall. This is um, just a small selection. Right. That was the Queen outside Westminster Abbey okay. in 1997. I, I love these, though, you know, this is the side of her we never see in the papers. It's a wonderful smile again. She's got a wonderful smile, very infectious. Yeah. And very spontaneous, too. Uh, she, you know, she's, the Queen isn't an actress. She's her own true self. Yeah. Oh, this is brilliant, uh, this one. Look well, at that. And that was in 1992, taken in Wakefield in Yorkshire. So the character that she's got in all these photos is no, really eyes. great. She's got beautiful blue eyes. She looks very animated. Yeah, in that doesn't one. she? Just, I was about to say, she looks so alive. Yes. There was an occasion in the late 1980s when she was just sort of getting to know me, and it was in Burnley in Lancashire, and I do remember this well. Uh, I'd waited quite a long time with a friend to see it, and she came along and did her walkabout. And she was about to walk away, and I said, Your Majesty, uh, could I take another photograph of you, please? Uh, because I may not see you again for some time. And she said, oh, she said, I'm not so sure about that because you turn up everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I sang in the Commonwealth Day uh, in Westminster Abbey. And then at the end of it, you know, we were all in a room wait waiting to meet Her, Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, she went, by the way, my husband loves your radio show. Oh, and, I, and I was like, OK, so off he came, up, up he came, and I said to him, oh, your wife tells me you listen to my radio show. He said, rubbish, rubbish. <laughs> the only person I listen to is that cheeky little Welsh chappy. And I went, that's me. Oh. <laughs> that's what a me. wonderful story. So the next Sunday I said, and if you're listening, ma'am, uh, this is for you. <laughs> Played her a nice bit of Elgar. Isn't he such a great guy? And what commitment he's shown Her Majesty over the years. Incredible. 6,000 photos of the royal family. And uh, you see a side in his photos that you, you don't normally see in the press. Uh, look at that. Every person in Britain should see Her Majesty like that. Full of life, full of love. Absolutely brilliant. And also, I'm so pleased that he reaffirmed what um, I thought I knew anyway in the fact that she likes having a laugh, just like the rest of us. Good on Her Majesty. And Her Majesty's sense of humour hasn't gone unnoticed by the Welsh. Howell Roberts met her in 2010. One of the people I introduced was a man called uh, Will Williams from Carnarvon. And he's uh, a Ricky Tomlinson lookalike. OK. So I introduced him to the Queen. I, I explained that he was a, a lookalike for a, a famous TV actor. Uh -huh. And I said, he appears in a programme called The Royal Family. And then she said, oh, is it about a man in a vest sitting on a settee? <laughs> And then Will uh, uh, said, oh, you watched it, Your Majesty. <laughs> and uh, she very quickly said, I've seen it once. <laughs> <laughs> well, if she uh, watches the royal family, she's obviously watching this. So have you got a, a message for Her Majesty? Well, I, I wish Your Majesty a very happy birthday. Pembroke Happy Sion from the royal town of Carnarvon. 
Mechi, in Welsh and English. Well, if there's one thing I'm hearing, it's that Her Majesty is happy to chew the fat with people from all walks of life. The Queen is so familiar to us, isn't she? After all, we all carry a picture of her in our pockets everywhere we go. But did you know where every single one of these coins is made? Right here in Wales. The land of my father's has been home to the Royal Mint since 1968. And I tell you what, we Welsh are dead proud that we look after the Queen's cash. The Queen opened the new Royal Mint near Cardiff. It was built to carry out the huge task of replacing our currency from old money to the new decimal coinage. 2,000 million new coins had to be made. Nearly 50 years on, and there's a new coin hot off the press. Royal Mint Museum curator Graham Dyer is giving us a sneaky peek. We've just issued a, a new coin to commemorate the 90th birthday uh, of the Queen. And, and here it is, showing the royal cipher and those magic figures 90 within a rather nice wreath. As Britain's longest serving monarch, Her Majesty's portrait on our coins has changed over her 64 year reign. What we have on the table are the five basic portraits of the Queen as we've travelled on this journey from 1952 until today. A competition is held each time the Queen's portrait is updated. Entries in the form of plaster models are judged by a special panel. Our understanding is that the, the Queen is, is very relaxed at the way the portraits have shown her gently ageing with, with the years. We were perhaps a little concerned when the Rand Broadley portrait was done that she might think it was unduly realistic, but she had no problem with it at all. It's interesting when you look at the last of the portraits, the fifth portrait, where there's the hint uh, of a smile and you can almost sense uh, the Queen's satisfaction at a job well done. We even now had five portraits uh, of the Queen. She looks in remarkably good health. Whether it will stretch to a sixth portrait, I don't know. Whether I will stretch <laughs> and be around for a sixth portrait, I, I don't know. Well, if we do get portrait number six, I know who I'd get to design it. Are you watching Mr Burns' class in Abba Van? So far on my travels, uh, I've heard a lot about how much the Queen has done for Wales as a country and the people of Wales. But I'm on my way to meet a very special person who's done quite a bit for the Queen, actually. Corgis, as Welsh as leeks, love spoons, and the town with the really long name. They've been the Queen's constant companion for over 70 years. Hickman. And one woman in South Wales has played a big part in keeping that tradition alive. Mary, how lovely Hello. to see you. How are you? Very well, thank you. Mary Davis has been breeding corgis for over 30 years, even winning best of breed at Crufts. And, and how, how come the Queen came into your life then? How did um, that all come about? Well, in 1992, so it's quite a long time ago, um, she used one of my stud dogs. Right. And had a litter. OK. How did you feel, though? It, it, what an honour. Oh, yeah, well, we were very proud. You know, my husband was too, and my, uh, my mother, she, she thought it was wonderful. I think it's wonderful, <laughs> I really do. Uh, so, what was it like when you first met her? Uh, a bit daunting. Was it? You know, yes, but at the same time, she made you feel very much at ease. She yeah. was very easy to talk to once you'd got over the first few nerves. So do you get any perks by being, you know, a breeder to the Queen? She gave me a puppy. Oh, which right. Which was very nice. Oh, well, how gorgeous. Yes. She was called Quiz. Right. She was a lovely dog. And here's Her Majesty catching up with Mary and Quiz 
at her Golden Jubilee in 2002. She just asked me uh, who the dogs were, and she was very interested to know that this was quiz. She made a great fuss of her. How hands-on is she with, with her corgis? Oh, very much so. I mean, one time when I saw her, she was just wearing a mac and boots and a headscarf, and she bundled them all in the back of her car. Or even the back of her plane. Her Majesty has owned over 30 corgis during her reign. Her husband, Prince Philip, calls them her dog mechanism, her way of relaxing. Well, it's obvious you love your dogs. They're, they're immaculate. The Queen really loves her animals oh, as well, she doesn't does. she? Oh, she does. She even took one on honeymoon with her. One what? Corgi? A corgi, yes. No. Susan, cor corgi called Susan. So Susan went on honeymoon with Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. That's right. wonder how he felt about that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably jealous. <laughs> Should we carry on? They're itching to go, aren't they? Come on. Well, I never knew the Queen's Corgis came from Pembrokeshire in Wales. I shouldn't be surprised, really. All the best things come from Wales, after all. And uh, in the few moments that I spent with Mary's Corgis, you can see why she loves them. They're charming, playful. I want one for myself now. Her Majesty has reigned for 64 years, hosted garden parties for over a million people and awarded 150,000 honours. With her 10th decade fast approaching, there are few signs of her slowing down. I'm nearly at the end of our people's portrait of Her Majesty in Wales, but there's one special lady you still have to meet. 90-year-old Hilda Price was born on the 21st of April, 1926, the same day as the Queen. Oh, I loved her to death. <laughs> She's absolutely wonderful. I sit here often and think, see what, where she is and what she's doing, and I think, well, I don't think I could do that. But she always looks as if she's enjoying everything. So I really admire her. Every year, she sends the Queen a birthday card. Wishing you many happy returns of the day from your twin, Hilda Clay Price. Hilda's met Her Majesty several times. Each time I, I felt that she's so normal, can I say? And um, like one of us when she speaks to us. And I think that's, that's a real gift because um, you know, she's far away from us, really. <laughs> In 2006, Hilda was invited to celebrate her 80th birthday alongside Her Majesty at Buckingham Palace. It was such a wonderful feeling to be sitting there, seeing the Duke of Edinburgh sitting by her, and we were on the, almost the next table to them. I was lucky enough to have a photo taken with her and it went into the Hello magazine. Oh, we had a beautiful time there. She spoke to us very well and we got to know people there and we were allowed to go around the palace. Wishing you a very happy 90th birthday, ma'am. And wishing us both good health. You know, in the few encounters I've had with Her Majesty the Queen, I've definitely witnessed her personal side. But what's made a, a massive impact on me on my trip around the whole of Wales is just how caring she's been to the Welsh people. Whether it's recognising hard-working individuals or showing parental love and support to a whole community who lost so much. She's got that magic touch, I suppose, that makes everyone who comes into contact with her feel really, really special. And it's made me realise how lucky we are to have her. Thank you.